do. Oh, well, Adam's already done it. Oh, even better. That's, and that's the that's the Debbie McGee moment, isn't it? It's great. A great, a great assistant. Um, so yeah, so so we are recording. So if you don't want your uh, face seen, please turn the video off, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll continue through. The reason we record this is uh, we send the the links back out to people after the session, uh, and because lots of people uh, sign up for sessions, and not so many people tend to attend them. So, so that's the reason we record them. Um, cool. Uh, and that's me done for the intro. Good. Done in three minutes, which is good. So um, over to Simon, uh, ready to embrace the journey. Over to you, Simon. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Ju. Thanks for that. Um, now, do you want to stop screen sharing? I'll, I'll share my screen. Uh, let's see if this works. Okay. Yeah. Share. Can you see this? Has this one popped up? Yes, you can. You, you yeah, even tell me. That's really good. Okay, so yeah. Uh, yes. So hi, hi everyone. Um, really nice to be at Agile Reading again. If any of you were here for the Experience of Flowers Design Thinking workshop a few months back, great to see you again. If not, it's really nice to meet all of you lovely new people here today. So. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about journey management. So I've been researching around this um, for the last month, and it's going to be, a, it's going to be big. Uh, if, you, if you're working in product or service design or digital in general, it's definitely a trend to have on your radar. Um, Stu's covered most of this, but yeah, a little about me. Um, I've been working in consulting for the last six years, so um, about four and a half and digital, so I know... Stu and Adam and Agile Reading really well. Before this at Cap Gemini, and then prior to that, I uh, set up a successful ed tech company as as the director of product um, uh, like some time ago. So I was working there for a good dozen years or so. And what I do is I help companies create apps that customers love, and I do this by putting custom insight at the heart of business decision making. So what I'm going to do, actually, just quickly, I'm going to, if I can, how do I get back to the, one sec, I'm going to just post some contact details in the chat, and then I'll share the screen again. So yes, um, I posted some links uh, uh, in, in the chat. So what you're going to find out in this presentation, I love to talk, and you can make contact with me through these links. So if you if you leave today and you've got a burning question or you've got a great journey management anecdote or you just want to have an online coffee, please reach out. I'd, I'd really appreciate it. So here's, here's what we'll cover today. So journey mapping, uh, why I love it and also how it breaks my heart. We're going to explore a little bit why businesses struggle to be customer centric. Uh, I'm going to show you some new tools that support journey management, and I'll share some ideas about how to get off to a great start with a CX transformation. And I'm going to start with, yeah, got a broken heart emoji <laughs> popping up, yeah. I'm going to start with a question. Why do businesses spend time and energy to understand the customer view, the customer perspective, and then discard it when they move to build? So. It's quite specific. So I'm going to start with a couple of stories to bring this to life. But keep this question in mind because we'll come back to this. So I've worked in product for a long time. And for over a decade, my career focus was agile and tech. So I helped agile tech teams build great products. And largely, this was through hard work and intuition and launching products and then just reacting to whatever uh, customer feedback came through from the support team and at this at this point I honestly didn't know there was a better way um, so this this all changed in 2017 when I was first introduced to customer experience work and I was lucky enough to work with a guy called Maurizio Rocca he's the XD design lead at Capgemini and we worked together for nine months on a research and design project at Waitrose and we started with journey mapping. And from day one, I was hooked. So 
a description of what we were creating. If you think of all the goods in Waitrose store, they all get onto the shelves through a complex dance between the Waitrose buyers and the goods suppliers. So we worked on designs for the new app to manage the relationship between the in-house Waitrose team and the suppliers that provide all the goods in the Waitrose store. And here's why I love this approach. I was given an invite into this world of buying and selling and given the task of understanding the lives and the goals and the trials and the tribulations of a community with a shared purpose to stop Waitrose with amazing products. It's just fascinating. So I talked to dozens of people from Waitrose and from suppliers to build up a comprehensive picture, the real picture of the journey of a product from the supplier to the shelf. And even better, after studying kind of what happens now, I was asked to design something better uh, to help improve their lives. So it was just a really fun thing to do. So what this felt like was I was learning about the real Waitrose, which was really interesting. And also was super confident that we're designing something that would greatly improve the lives of this community because we had evidence to back it up. We'd heard firsthand how our designs would help. So this customer-centered approach just made a lot more sense to me than being given a backlog and working blindly from it. And I was really fortunate to learn from the best. Maurizio, he's a super talented guy. He's a joy to work with. So from this point onwards, I've turned to journey mapping and other types of mapping to understand the business, the goals, the challenges and the opportunities that will drive growth and improve customers' lives. So over the years, I've, I've done a lot of mapping of uh, pension and insurance journeys at large banks. So, you know, quite a complex online journey and, and, and uh, supported by various teams in the banks. Um, at a Fortune 500 beverage manufacturer, I created a service blueprint for the full year life cycle for the sales team. And because of how they sell beer in the US, it's a really complicated b 2 b to c process. Um, another interesting one, mapping the end-to-end -end business journey of a neuromarketing company. So they, they put a brain scanner on your head and they show you adverts and they can predict if the advert will be a success. It's really cool. So it's a bit like Elon Musk's Neuralink. <laughs> um, so yeah, some examples and there were more. And over the past six years, I've grown to understand how important this work is. So firstly, it leads to great products because high quality customer insight gives you answers to solve product challenges. But more than that, this is the work that brings meaning to products. Um, a clear perspective on the customer journey can allow us to do things like address ethical issues and create apps that are net positive for society. Um, like an aside, there is no reason why our communication tools that the world uses need to cause genocide. That Facebook, that's the design flaw by Facebook. Uh, that, that could have been avoided through research and design. Yeah. Um, and I think that's also important with, with all the AI changes that we're going to see um, over the coming year, because things are going to change fast. But there was always a problem with journey mapping. Something just doesn't work. Let me explain the problem with another story, which is something that I've experienced several times, actually. So I'm in the boardroom with about a dozen people. And we're at the end of a six week journey mapping uh, engagement and the room's buzzing. We've just walked through the customer journey with this team and they've, they've all been involved over the last six weeks. And this presentation is the distillation of their insights and customer insights. And we've distilled this down into a beautiful journey map and personas with recommendations. And everyone has a clear, shared picture of the customer journey. We know the goals, we know their pains. We can clearly see how to improve their lives and at the same time, drive business growth. And people love it. The, the head of digital is giving me a high five and product managers are sort of chest bumping at the back of the room and the XD team, they're just delirious because some actual real research happened. 
The techies are happy because they know what they're going to build next. And importantly, leadership are happy. They're happy because the product team is talking in a language that they understand, which doesn't always happen. And also we're talking about growth and metrics that they care about. So I'm happy with this because it's been a Herculean task. To get here, we've interviewed dozens of customers, business stakeholders. We've created these beautiful maps. We've overlaid pain points and opportunities. We've created a prototype and a roadmap, and then we've packaged this all up into a really tight one hour presentation. So to summarize, the reason everyone buys into this and sees the value is because in this meeting, customer centricity is in the room. We're looking at the process through our customers' eyes and we can see what's wrong and how to improve. And the whole team's aligned on it. So everyone heads home happy. Monday morning, into the office, and this is where everything starts to go wrong. So the journey maps and personas have been taken down. Now the roadmap's on the wall. Tickets are being put into JIRA at an incredible rate. <laughs> now, the thing to remember is there is no customer centricity in JIRA. None. Yeah? The process moves to Agile and that's it. We're into the build trap. And we see all that effort to bring the customer view to life dissipate. It's like, it's like sand through my fingers. So the customer research becomes a point in time that people refer back to. We did the research, so what we're building is right, becomes a mantra repeated around the business. Over months, this turns into someone did some research at some point in the past. I haven't seen it, but it was done, so this is what we're building. Yeah, <laughs> Sue's laughing, because he's been there. So this for, this for me, it, it's, it's way too common and it's sad and it's frustrating. So come back to the question. So why do businesses spend time and energy to understand the customer view and then discard it when they move to build? So before we answer this question, I'll give you a clue. It's not because customer centricity has no value. So intuitively, we know it has value. If you Oh, I keep on clicking. If, you, if your customers love your products and service, they'll pay more and stay longer, right? It's common sense, but you don't have to take my word for it. There are countless studies that demonstrate the return of investment on customer experience. Just Google customer experience statistics. So here are some examples. 86% of customers would pay more for better customer experience. You can literally ask your customers for more money. 50% of customers would switch to a competitor after one bad experience. That's, that's why it's really important to understand your bad experiences. And a 5% increase in customer retention leads to at least 25% increase in profit and, and up to a 95% increase in profit, which is huge. Okay, so back to the question, brought it to life with a couple of stories, and I'll, I'll open this up to the chat. So if you, if you have an answer, just, just share it in the chat. I'm sure the hive mind of this group here will have some great answers to it. So why do businesses spend time um, uh, to understand the customer view and then discard it when they move to build? So I'll just give I'll just give a give a moment, see if anything pops up in the chat. Um, change the chat. Oh, there's a couple of things appearing. Oh, that's interesting. They need to increase confidence to get over a limit but then they can move on. Right, they've, they've, they've got the answer. They can, they can, they've answered it. They can, they, can, they can just take that step and move forward with the thing. Uh, is that right, Stu? Is that what you were? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, yeah. And I was just writing a sort of secondary response, which is they, they've convinced someone to give them money. 
They've got the money. Don't need to waste time with uh, thinking about why why we're doing something. Yeah, because it's Amir, because it's not profitable sometimes. That's interesting as well. Is it is it like um is it the process of doing the Yeah. So um hi, my name is Amir. So essentially it was actually I could relate to it. So I was working on a project where we were kind of working on our subscription based model where we're kind of signing up customers on subscription. So uh spent a lot of time um, sort of uh, implementing this new feature and i don't mind telling it was basically trying to pause the subscription and so mm -hmm. um but after some time what have what happened was that it was obviously a uh, pitched as a very great solution for customer it would give them extra flexibility and stuff like that but what they found out was that customers were actually using it as a de facto cancel option so they couldn't foresee if they couldn't forecast their profits uh, properly and you know they had to abandon this feature and mind you they spend a lot of time um, to kind of uh, pitch for the for the benefits of this feature <laughs> and they spend quite a lot of time implementing it as well so, yeah right that's really interesting so right so and and so but then it got to a point where it's like this feature doesn't work and they had to can it yeah so it, it it actually um sort of essentially using it as a uh, for, for for canceling the subscriptions you see so <laughs> right yeah. started to lose them did he yeah. probably exactly the opposite of what they were hoping for uh, yeah yeah exactly and um where it was a great flexibility for the customers um it wasn't for the business because they couldn't forecast their profits properly and stuff like that yeah that's so interesting yeah and then we've got um from joe because they don't revisit the customer view yeah so so they sort of um once the view is there yeah i wonder is, is that is that because people don't feel the need or don't see the value or um maybe it's similar to what to what adam's written here they they do it when the consultants are in but can't afford to keep them around so that that's actually about skills and capability within the in-house team or, or something like that maybe i don't know any 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 thoughts i don't yeah well i'd say that sort of thing i mean i was being a bit tongue-in-cheek but uh, it's it's like you it's that event so like you were saying when you play it back uh it seems like tick we've done that we've done our customer centricity now get on and do the work Mm, totally. Well, there's a couple of couple of good ones here as well. Leaders want to be customer centric, but don't have the right structure, language, tools, or processes to do it at scale. Yeah, this is um, yeah, this this points to uh, to to the wider the wider challenge of moving to um, uh, customer centric ways of working. So it's like the 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 will is there, but just uh, the ability to actually uh, execute on that is 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 a challenge. Mm. Yeah, I, I can jump in there, Simon. Cool. I'm I'm the the dreaded consultant that comes in and does it once <laughs> and leaves. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, not someone at C-suite's like we're becoming customer centric. Let's get expensive consultants in just mm. to lay out this new way of working and make a lovely ecosystem of journeys that no one become very expensive wallpaper. Mm. That's, no one can act on and it's a static tool that cross-functionally means nothing but you know to one cx team means the world so did did my did my story resonate then <laughs> that's just my life <laughs> yeah yeah that's it's sad, isn't it? time it's... The big four, that's just what you do time and time again it's yeah. very frustrating yes and there's a really interesting one from debbie here so because it's easier to point to a fixed scope and say we've built it than to be responsible for outcomes totally is yeah that's like uh it, it's, it's just easier but at the same time less useful yeah um time to market um da, is, is that is that um i don't know if you can hear my dog start, starting to growl and bark in the background da, do, do, do you want to just 
say yeah. something about the time to market and I'll grab my dog. Hold on. I'll be two seconds. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh yeah. look at that. There we go. He's got to he's just got to keep him on my lap or he just won't stop barking. Yeah. There's loads of good things. Loads of good things in, in, in here. Uh, difficult to execute operationally. They've ticked the box. I love the expression expensive wallpaper. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get some of the expensive wallpaper and paper my office. I think it would be nice. <laughs> like, like, some, like, just, <laughs> just, just journey maps that time forgot. <laughs> it is literally the most expensive wallpaper you that, that you can find, I think. Yeah. So, cool. Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks so much for that. I'm going to take these and make my presentation better from this. <laughs> but I, I did have a couple of um, thoughts on it myself. So um, I've got two reasons, two big reasons that are super important. So here's the first. Currently, journey mapping work happens in digital whiteboards, so Miro, Mural, FigJam, PowerPoint, sometimes Excel. So this causes issues. So every journey map's formatted differently. Related journeys are not linked. The information isn't dynamic. And there's, there's no version control, workflow, quality assurance. Um, so my take on this is you can't run a business from a digital whiteboard. It's just never gonna work. So journey map stored in Miro will never provide the source of truth needed for teams to collaborate uh, at scale and have faith in the data. So a useful comparison is Jira used for Agile. So I got my issues with Jira and customer centricity, but there's several, several reasons that Jira is used by hundreds of thousands of companies to organize their agile teams. So all the project data is centralized in real time. So there's a single source of truth. It's configurable, so it can be changed to fit your workflow. The data is auditable, so we can review how work is flowing through the system. And then there are summaries, like you've got burn down charts or roadmaps or, or that sort of thing built into the software. So imagine data in Jira stored in Miro. You'd have freeform post-its in freeform columns. You'd have definitions of done on tickets next to the main post-it. Each week, someone would go into the Miro and try and extract the data to make their burn down chart. Uh, and the roadmap would be, just be completely separate, It'd be somewhere in a PowerPoint. I mean, it's just a terrible idea. It would be chaos. Um, it would be completely unworkable for anything other than the absolute simplest uh, digital project. Just going to check the video to see if anyone's making facial expressions that they use Miro to organize their agile. But I'm not seeing it at the moment. So that's good. I've, I've tried it on small projects, like you say. But then you kind of run into a roadblock and go, no, yeah, maybe not. If, if it's three people, it can work, I think. Yeah, anything bigger, it gets tough. But that is how CX information is currently managed. So all the information from personas, interviews, insights, opportunities, solutions, they're basically stored ad hoc. So this is my first reason why businesses spend a large amount of time and energy to create the customer view and then discard it. Currently, there isn't a single source of truth to bring this data together. And journey maps are complicated. It's just, it's just too much effort to create a coherent, joined up view across all the journeys. It's too difficult to organize the information in digital whiteboards. So this brings me to They Do. So I'm super excited about They Do. It's a new journey management app. Does a number of things that I haven't seen before. So here's an overview of what it does. Um, firstly, you can create customer journeys and personas in the app. So this stores all the maps in one place. The format becomes consistent and the consistency speeds up creating and interpreting the journey maps. The journeys are also highly configurable. So you can set this up to fit journeys or blueprints that your team creates or for a specific industry. So the next important feature 
is we can link individual journeys to a higher level framework. So a common example, the over my, overview might be something like the customer life cycles. You might have stages like awareness, engagement, evaluation, purchase, uh, or here on this example, I'm not a customer, I become a customer, I am a customer, I renew. And the individual journeys can be linked to this customer life cycle. So you can see the context of where all the journeys fit into the customer's experience. So whenever I work on a project, I always create an overview. At, at any point on a project, you're likely to need to explain to someone new to the project, what's the purpose of it? What's the overview? And how does the thing that you're looking at fit into that overall picture? So that's what the overview is for. It's just really important for context. So in the past, I create this as a standalone document. And the big issue there is, as soon as it's published, it's out of date. So this feature, it gives you the same overview, but it's dynamically linked to all the customer journeys that you, that you create and it updates in real time. And then finally, we can add metrics and insights and opportunities to each journey. So this is actually really similar to normal journey mapping. Every journey map has uh, a bunch of uh, information on needs and pain points and touch points and metrics. Um, here you can see some examples for opportunities. So what the added value here is, is all of this information can then be viewed like um, at, a high, at that higher level. So you can review and prioritize all the opportunities across all the journeys uh, or all the solutions across all the journeys. So what this is super useful for is conversations with leadership. This gives a view of all the, all the possible work and all the work that's actually happening and the value that you expect it to have. And it, it gives you a helicopter view and allows you to prioritize across everything rather than the information getting lost at the journey level. So I just wanna make it clear I'm not being paid by they do. It's just my opinion. This app is going to make journey management and CX transformation much easier. Um, I haven't seen anything else that does this. Uh, I'm personally really excited to try it with clients. Um, I had a very similar feeling the first time I used Figma. It was like this, this thing is going to this thing's going to change. Uh, this is this is going to change how people work. Okay, so. On they do to summarize, uh, it helps solve exactly the problem I outlined earlier. So journey mapping is faster and more consistent, which reduce costs. Um, the real time overview of opportunities and solutions uh, gives leadership a view of how CX is actually driving business value. Uh, and you get that single source of truth. So it's like that real time uh, single source of truth that a team can have confidence in and work around. So. It looks to me like it provides, it, in, in the way JIRA is a single source of truth for agile teams, they do can be a single source of truth for um, uh, uh, CX information. So that was the first reason. So heading back to my question, there's a second reason that businesses struggle with customer experience work. Um, moving to a customer experience led approach is just a big change. I think in, in one of the comments people, um, uh, one of the uh, answers people gave to the question, um, I mean, it's transformational work, it impacts many teams. It raises challenging questions like, how do we ensure leadership are bought in? Or what changes to people, process and technology do we need for this to stick? Um, or how, how do we approach the cultural change so that we bring everyone along on this journey? Uh, and CX transformation is iterative. So a big question is, where do we start and, and how do we get measurable results fast? And they do doesn't answer any of these questions. Again, it's like JIRA. JIRA doesn't make you good at agile. It just doesn't address the people, communication, and process challenges needed to create a high-performing 
agile teams. So what I've, what I've got now for the, for the last 10 minutes, I've got a few tips on how you can get started with uh, journey management and a CX transformation. So firstly, a really good place to start for me, it's where I usually start, is, is an assessment on CX maturity. So it's really useful because it gives context to understand your strengths and weaknesses and gives a great steer on where is a good place to start. So here's a UX maturity model by Nilsson Norman. I'll just take you through the stages quickly. And while I do this, I'd like you to think of the company that you're working at now or the last client that you worked on and just try and pinpoint uh, the stage that you think the company's at. And after this, people can put it in the chat. So if you think, oh, I'm a two, you could just, you could just pop it in the chat. So one is absent, that's pretty straightforward. Basically, you don't have any designers or researchers. The digital team never talks to customers. If some people do talk about UX, they're just ignored by leadership. Pretty straightforward. Two is limited. So at this point, you'll have small UX efforts, usually for one of two reasons. So either there's a UX aware individual who just takes initiative and does something, or there'll be like an experimental team trying it out. So it's small, ad hoc, uh, maybe one or two teams is often stop start. Um, three is emergent. So some teams do UX research and design. There might be a UX budget. Um, there are some specific UX and research roles, but not nearly enough. Um, often UX and researchers are spread thinly across many product teams so they're not they don't have their head in a product or a journey they're just jumping from team to team trying to fix everything uh, and then the ux approach is is inconsistent so I'll, as i'm doing this think just just in your mind think of the last place you were at but where, where does it fit so we move into the top half so four is structured so at this point leadership they understand and they buy into the value of ux there's a UX budget, there's a structured team, there are learning pathways. So there's like a bit of a career progression for um, uh, designers. Um, and then it starts to be consistency across teams. So at stage four, the big challenges are many departments still don't understand the value of it. So there's a lot of explaining to do and getting buy-in from teams around uh, the company. And there's still a lot of product development, as we discussed earlier, that isn't iterative and doesn't react to customer insights. So there's still a lot of teams just building stuff at stage four. Okay, and then you get to five and six and it becomes, these, these are uh, um, where it's all, all coming together. So at stage five, almost all teams are doing research and design. Everyone gets the benefits. There's a clear link to UX research and design work and the business benefits this, that this creates. So stage five, it's, the UX is really quite uh, effective at supporting business goals. But the real drivers for the business still aren't customer centric. So other factors are driving the business. Uh, the, the top level business decisions uh, are, are driven by something else. And then stage six, this is a bit like a UX Nirvana stage. Um, CX at this point is the primary driver of company strategy and project prioritization. And UX is a habit and everyone just does it as a matter of course. And I think very few companies get to this level. Because I've been working in consulting, I probably don't get to meet them because they don't, they don't need a consultant to come in. They, 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 they're doing it brilliantly themselves. Um, so you might have already done it. Just ping the numbers. If you if you want to just ping the numbers in the chat, see if I can, how do I get the chat up? Uh, chat, see what sort of numbers we get. I think there's a, how do I get there? Between the three and four, four, best of words is a four, two to three. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, Stu. You're 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 going for a there's a bit of five in there, Stu. Oh, I'm impressed. But there is. I mean, the, 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 the clients I'm working with, that they are towards that. But the strange thing is, there'll be somewhere between four and five, and then occasionally they'll revert revert back to zero. 
uh, <laughs> and then they'll go back to four and five and then, and then they're, they're back in four and five and they're really good and they're oh, yeah we get this we get this we get this uh no back to zero and then and then reverting back again so they they, they know the structure they know they what they what they need to do but occasionally they get a jfdi and then they just have to flip and do it mm. and it, it's not customer centric and so um yeah cult, culture eats journey mapping for breakfast so it's interesting so so like a top down dictum turns up and it, and it's just like right just do the stuff yeah oh. yeah there's a couple of interesting there's one there's a great one here from debbie i've i've seen team members called ux designers but their role was seen as can you make this product we've already built look a bit nicer more on brand <laughs> it's like ux from 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 the 90s or the noughties isn't it oh that was a yeah time. definitely very old school and yeah. i see that when it's a company that aren't really a product company that have got an it department who then get ambitious and decide they can build products because they've got some it people um and then they don't look very nice so they bring in some people who they think of as kind of graphic designers to smarten it up um it's terrible for, for it's such retention. A waste. terrible for retention of talented designers yeah, yeah it's, absolutely it's just, just never just, encountered like what design can do for you and what it means yeah i guess that that's probably down at down at the lower end that one oh. Oh, that's good. It's interesting. There's, there's quite a few fours in there. Awesome. Okay, so I can get my slides up. So we did a bit of a poll. Thanks for that. Um, so yeah, I, I I I think that starting with this sort of assessment can be super useful. It doesn't take long. Uh, a few interviews with some people around the business, maybe ten to twelve pe twelve people is good then write things up and play this back to the team and leadership. Um, I've got a link when we send things out, I've got a link to an assessment you can use. Um, uh, and it kind of gets people into the space of thinking about it and, and where they are. And it will give you a really clear indication. Another big benefit of it is it gives you an indication of whether journey management is for you. And it's, it's not for everyone. So for example, if you're an early stage startup, who's lean and pivoting based on, you know, you get some new data and, and you sort of, uh, there's no point in expending loads of energy in mapping things to the nth degree. Uh, time's just really limited. You'll have a small team. Everyone will have it in their heads anyway. So I just don't think it really makes sense for this. Uh, another example for companies that are in maturity stages one or two, something I've seen before is, if there's no, sometimes there's just no leadership buy-in. It's just not there. And, and, and if, if there isn't uh, someone on the executive team who, who, who can sponsor this thing, it's pretty much a non-starter. So it's always gonna, this sort of work is always gonna lead to changes in people, process and technology. So if there isn't a forum to discuss this with the people who would need to okay it, it becomes really high risk to do lots of work on process and technology. So good starting point in that situation can be just a really simple presentation to an executive who you think might be an ally, followed by a small pilot, um, create some evidence and play it back to leadership. And um, this can be done really quickly, uh, gets you a clear answer, and you just get a really clear steer from leadership on whether there is there is there support to continue or, or is it worth just, just calling a halt to it? On the other hand, some businesses can gain a lot from journey management. For, uh, for example, established medium-sized businesses, they've been working agile in tech and they want to move to a customer-driven approach. Uh, they, perhaps you're trying out frameworks like continuous discovery uh, and lean UX. Um, my view from uh, looking into this is that journey management now offers pretty much the fastest route to increased CX maturity. Okay, another, another really important starting point for me, um, it's important to align journey management uh, with other frameworks that you're already using. So 
over the years, there's a number of frameworks that I keep going back to because uh, they're really good at getting results. These are some frameworks that I, uh, that I use a lot. Uh, and your business might use some of these. Um, and the good news is that journey management is complementary to, to these. So if you're using Agile, uh, this can work hand in hand with journey management. If you're using continuous discovery, again, it aligns really well to how journey management works. So it, I just think it's really important that businesses keep what is working uh, and introduce journey management alongside this so that they are complementary. Because the last thing that we need is to introduce something completely new and throw out all the things that were new last year, you know? And there's no need because each of these frameworks can be, can be enhanced with, with journey management. Okay, so once we're clear on CX maturity, um, we've covered important aspects like leadership alignment and existing frameworks. There are some basic technical and process foundations that will set you up for journey management. Um, I've listed them here. They're things like setting up OKRs uh, along with leadership. So getting together with leadership and, and uh, making sure that there's alignment on business purpose. Um, the second one is creating a customer journey overview. So this is that sort of higher level overview that gives you context across um, uh, the entire journey, which is really useful for context. The third one I've got here is creating journey map skeletons. Um, so this is, it's a really quick and simple way to make your initial uh, customer interviews much more effective. So how I do this is spend a small amount of time, find some experts in the business who can give you some of their time and spend, spend a small amount of time box time to create a first draft of the journey maps um, before, you, before you go out to um, other people in the business and, and customers. Um, it just makes those initial um, conversations go so much better if you've, if you've already got something there, even if it's um, not quite right or there's something missing. Having, having that, that sort of skeleton to, to start with just makes everything uh, move forward much faster. The fourth one's about setting up website analytics. Um, so you, you could well have uh, some analytics framework in place. It's worth very early on just checking the analytics that are in place and what you are going to need to measure for success. Um, because if you set that up early, it gives you some baseline data to track progress against. Uh, and then finally, um, creating an opportunity solution tree. Um, this is an approach from continuous discovery that I just, I just love it. It's just brilliant. So um, getting together with the product team or even just the, the product design uh, and tech leads and, and a key business stakeholder and creating a first draft opportunity solution tree, it leads to really useful conversations with leadership from early on. Uh, um, so yeah, these would be these would be five steps that I think are uh, uh, a useful start. So that that would that would be it for me. So th these would be where I would start a, a CX maturity assessment, making sure you've got leadership buy-in, um, understanding and aligning the approach to your existing frameworks, and then setting these five foundations. So. It doesn't take long to do this. This is the like this. This is this can be done in a few days of actual work uh, with a running time of a few weeks. Uh, and basically, this gives you everything you need for your teams to get started with confidence and start to embed customer insight into the product development process. Um, and this this then leads on to um, actually collecting customer insight. So this, this would be when we start creating hypotheses that need customer insight to validate, creating fast experiments, ideally literally running over, you know, over a day or two to validate our assumptions. And then 
talking to customers regularly, ideally each week at a set time to answer our questions and de-risk product development. Now I've skipped over this quite quickly because you could do a whole other session on this and also the foundations part. I put there's there's a uh, there's a blog post about the foundations part on my Substack if you're interested. Um, but yeah, what what this will lead to the outcome of this is uh, journey management can create a continuous conversation uh, between product teams, leadership, customers, and the wider business that links customer leads to business outcomes. So. Instead of one meeting where everyone's super happy and customer centricity is in the room, this can just become the normal day-to-day -day way of working across the business. Uh, and it doesn't mean everyone's super happy all the time. What it means is people start coming to meetings and saying, well, hold on, why, why haven't we got, you know, why is this discussion we're having not linked to customer needs and to business goals? Uh, and and um, yeah, ultimately, that is what leads to happy customers and increased profits. Okay. Oh, talking. So we covered quite a bit today. We covered journey mapping, why I love it and how it breaks my heart. We've explored why businesses spend time and energy to understand the customer view and then discard it when they move to build. We've looked at uh, a new tool that supports journey management that I think is going to have a big impact uh, in terms of allowing uh, allowing uh, journey management to, to be uh, implemented by companies. And then I've given some ideas uh, that I found effective about how to get started with a CX transformation. So I posted these in the chat uh, earlier. For me, I'm currently focusing my career squarely on journey management at this point. Um, I, I just look at it and it just makes total sense to me. I think this is going to be a really big step forward in the way that products are developed. So I'm currently at the research stage um, to understand how, pe how people are currently approaching journey management and the challenges that they have. So I'd love to talk. If you've, if you've got something to share, I've um, uh, just reach out on any of these channels. I'd, I'd love to um, uh, get your views on uh, how, how it's all working. And I think that's I think that's all I have to. And Adam, <laughs> I think that's it. I mean, you, you say you say all. Oh, it was amazing, Simon. So so first off, round of applause for Simon for everybody. <laughs> Well done. Because oh, because that was really good. Because oh, again, I love your style through this. It's just nice and calm and chill. But also, it, some of the stuff is groundbreaking. And this is this is why I thought this was really important for the group because we've all been doing the same stuff in this space for the last ten years. And it's time it gets this kind of kick up the ass to 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 bring it bring it forward. So so thank you so much. So um. So uh, we have some time for questions now. Uh, so we can either put questions in the chat. I don't know if there were any questions as we were going through. We kind of kind of covered most of them. Um, did, did anyone on the group either want to post a question or ask a question of Simon? Oh, hey, Debbie. Uh, Debbie. Hello. Hey, um, Debbie. Thanks for the talk. It was fantastic. Uh, I'm a product manager. Um, and I uh, absolutely love having UX designers on my product team. And in fact, I think it's essential. Um, I was surprised you sh had on your slide, and maybe I misunderstood your point. Um, I was surprised that you said it wasn't appropriate for lean startups or that it might not be appropriate for them. Um, because I would feel like getting that customer insight is essential at the startup phase so that you don't waste any of your precious resources building the wrong thing. You know, getting to product market fit is, is the only way you're going to get, have success as a yeah. startup. And I think it's fundamental to it. I think I wasn't clear. So I think getting the customer insight is 100% agree. It's like absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. and, and building that into, you know, your sort of, rapid lean 
iteration you know, uh, of, 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 of your product. It's just often in startups, you've got quite a small team. They're, they're, they're working on quite a focused product. There's not like a big sprawling, they'll have a thing. Mm -hmm. And often that team has a lot of the information in their heads because they're very focused on it. So it's, it's not the getting the customer insight, it's the putting in place a big scalable um, journey uh, like hierarchy of journeys so like that the that's... infrastructure on it yeah it's it's more the it's more the sort of um i i, I think i don't know <laughs> this is I and this could, I'm, I'm i'm totally open to being challenged yeah. with it as well but i think i think it could be you might spend like if you went down the full journey management route of putting this stuff in um you might almost spend too much time getting all these maps and all these mm -hmm. uh, all these frameworks and then you'll just pivot and, and like half of them will change <laughs> you're like, oh let's go and update all the maps yeah um, I guess it's got to be at an appropriate level for the size of the resources that you've got but I also think yeah a lot of teams at every scale have all these assumptions in their heads about what's going to work and a big part of the point of product management of agile development and of you know all the cx stuff is that we we might be wrong about a lot of that mm. We've got to test those assumptions and as a startup you've really got to test them very quickly because you will run out of money whereas 100%. big companies can afford to make a lot of these assumptions and keep rolling anyway even though they're doing the wrong things yeah i'll tell you what i'm going to revise it it's like I, I think that a, 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 a small, uh, like a lean startup, they would just need to be careful to set it up in a really lightweight way that, that mm -hmm. kind of could adapt to, to to rapid changes. I reckon. I reckon the the risk would be kind of going overkill in mapping and then having to spend a huge amount of energy changing it but yeah I'm to totally, I'm totally, yeah. totally on on I totally aligned with you that customer insight at that stage is is critical so it's, it's absolutely uh, fundamental to this to the start succeeding so uh, yeah and I, uh, yeah I, I like the challenge as well it's like I, the funny thing with journey management is very it's like a very young field so i think what it is in three years time will probably be very different to what it is now um so yeah maybe every startup will be using it in three years i, I don't know <laughs> yeah. does that does that, does that is a, it's a great question debbie does that give you does that clear yeah definitely the, yeah totally definitely. um there's a question in the chat as well do i read through or megs do you want to ask it yeah, sure. It might be one for another time. It's kind of a meaty question. I've got a load of government clients in Canada who are totally ready for journey management. And I know the first thing they're going to say is, where's the data store? Do we own the data? What are the privacy considerations? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> um, um, so yeah, I'm interested about that. And then interested in longer term, like how do third parties work with journey management software tools or how do they partner with them? to deploy it you know on other clients what does that look like but happy to take it offline as it's a big question <laughs> yeah yeah i know that they're definitely um uh, they do definitely being used in some big public yeah. uh companies so they must have something i haven't seen the they must have a crib sheet or something that tries to allay people's fears i would have thought yeah. i'm yeah. actually talking to someone in a pharma company i was asking them for exactly that thing Mm, okay uh, yesterday so and if, if you want to take the um the, the partnership yeah ping me about the um yeah. partnership question because we're trying to work that out now actually yeah um so just okay. just um uh, uh ping, ping me on linkedin or, or book in a chat will uh, i'll tell you what i know yeah awesome cool thank you so much great talk Cool. Uh, any other questions from the group or in the chat? There was a good one from, from Joe. Joe D uh, said, Go for it. Um, so going back to how does 
journey management differ from user story mapping that Jeff Patterson, Patter, Patton, sorry, Jeff Patton bestowed on the world in his research and book on the subject? Um, uh, so I haven't read Jeff Patton's book. Right. So I just need to check that the user story is, is, is the user story mapping uh sort of creating that visual it's it's yeah. The yeah. Journey thing. yeah okay yes so i think the big difference is um it's about making it scalable um so the the challenge with that i always had with the the, the journey maps is you, you can make a really lovely journey map but in a company of any size that journey map Will re you, you, around the edges of it are you know 10 or 20 or 100 other journeys and they're all kind of interrelated and it can be very difficult to um uh build that kind of holistic picture across an organization so journey management is about doing just that so it would be you have uh you know 20 or 100 or a thousand journeys but you can extract the insights across all of those journeys and 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 see them at that higher level and relate business value. So it's, it's sort of about it's journey mapping, but in a scalable way, I think. I think that's the I think that's the does that does that help, Joe? So it looks like there's a thumbs up. There's a it's thumbs good. up. Yeah, I, 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 have, I have a thing which kind of comes into that as well, because I can remember doing uh, some some really, really nice kind of physical story maps on the wall. Uh, mm. And it was at a telco and we had three scrum teams working together or working on stuff. And it was beautiful, but it took up a massive amount of wall. Yeah. And like we literally ran out of walls and we couldn't have added more teams to it and more people think work <laughs> to it because 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 we didn't have any physical space. And also this was in the old world where we, we all kind of went to the office every day and actually stood around it every day and did it. Mm -hmm. And whereas the, the, I, I imagine the, the benefit you get with, with a digital version of this is we can all do it from wherever we are and we can do it with a hundred teams yeah, and we can do it with various different things so so I, there is there's a limit to the physical space bit of of story mapping and i know there are story mapping tools as well which, which come from it but yeah um uh are there any other questions in the chat otherwise i've got a question mm -hmm. So, so the, the, the question the question I had was, was, was like, how do you? And I know you kind of said this at, at the end of the end of the talk, but like, imagine you are a person who is fairly new in product. Is this a thing you start with, or is this a thing that you become a master at, and then it's a, a thing you take on when you've got your black belt? Yeah. So, so is this a, is a thing you you start with? As you're new into product, or is this a thing that you are helping with when you are? kind of experienced like you mm. that's a good question um what i think is is it i mean it, it really is early days for, for journey management but my guess is that as this becomes um uh more mainstream and more companies are using it I think that for junior um, uh, customer experience or UX designers and researchers, it would be really useful to work at a company where they have this sort of structure. Because I think it will make your life so much easier. The people will be following, there'll be processes baked into how places work. Um, I don't know if this is a good answer. I guess if, you, if you're new and this sounds interesting, I guess um, probably UX research would be a great place to start. And and um, there would be online courses for this. And there are some really good boot camps now, like a sort of two or three month boot camps that you can go in and they, they give you a really good intro to research and design and the methods. Um, and there's probably other resources. It's another one. If, 
if, if, if there is anyone on the call who's like, you know, new to this and sort of thing, oh, that sounds interesting. Again, just drop in a, a call or a chat, happy to um, discuss with people how you might get started in this. Does that, does that answer your question? It, it does, it does. I mean, I was, I was just going to, because the, 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 the view I have and from the discussion from the last question and this question was, was, was it sort of feels that it's going to, it's going to fit better at corporate and large org and then roll downwards and that's how you're thinking about it but actually from debbie's point it may start at startup and then massively horizontally scale so and, and then more people be involved in it so I, i'm just trying to get my head in like how do people get into it um but your answer was cool um i have a fairly fairly that might be sound like a stupid question but then i'm going to ask it anyway so, so let's imagine let's imagine there are a hundred journeys within the corporate organization that I'm working with. Yeah. Would I would I produce all the journey maps for all the what ifs and the partials and the maybes and the should be's and could be's? So because because the challenge the challenge we have at the moment is in like in our Figma designs at the moment, there's a whole load of this is what we're going to do next and this is what we might do in the future and this is kind of out here somewhere and i'm trying to i'm trying to rationalize the the the, the now we're going to do these things in the next three months versus the the maybe in the future and i'm trying to work out if journey mapping and what if journey mapping and pro probabilistic journey mapping maybe is the thing i'm trying to get to um because it's been really useful hearing this. Because literally, I'm going to talk to people tomorrow morning about it. But, um. <laughs> oh, you're not going to like my answer, then, Stu. It's like the answer is I don't have an answer. It, it would be the sort of thing where if if I looked at if if I looked at a specific problem and it, it, the the answer probably depends a lot on the context. Oh, that's, an, that's a rubbish answer, isn't it, Stu? Because he's nodding. I, it, in it, I, I mean, like, again, I, 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 <laughs> you and I have worked in consultancy together. I, 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 that's a very good, solid client answer. It depends. It, it depends. <laughs> oh. Oh. But, yeah. oh, but, so, okay, so, so, so let, let me make, make, make it easier. So let's imagine I've got five journeys going on and there's a one that I might want to think about. Would I map them and do they sit in the same space within they do? Or is there a difference between the five which actually exist and the one that I might do? Ah, got you. Okay, yes. So they, they, there's there's really useful tagging in in there. So you can you can um, uh, you can kind of make as is journeys, and then you can make two B journeys, and you can tag them uh, so that you can show you know you can show everything, or you can show you can tag everything. It's it's quite clever how they've done it. So um uh, i guess you would have a journey with an opportunity and a solution on it and the solution would then lead to that that's the journey that we will have um in in the in in, in the future so yeah, but yeah and, that, and i think i think i think that's the thing i'm trying to work out is that like how do you how do you show a probable journey versus a possible journey versus a maybe journey uh versus your existing journeys and uh, and and again we, we, we've we been trying to figure this out in figma for the last week basically uh, and we've ended up building three clickable prototypes to describe the the here's what you're getting next here's what you might get and here's what might happen in the future the problem with them is because everyone wants to look at the future stuff because it's all shiny and ai yes. driven and everything else in the future whereas the thing that's actually going to happen in the next quarter is is less yeah, that. Yeah, and, and yeah. It, it's it, it, it's okay. it's that so, probabilistic piece probably okay so if you imagine you've got the journeys that are real at the moment and 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 um you know the, the what's actually happening off that you probably have opportunities and solutions so some of these solutions would have um prototypes associated to them so within the solutions coming off the actual journey you put the prototypes in them and you could tag the solutions as in like you know at now next you know future or, or or whatever so then then it becomes you you've got this list of solutions and you say well this is what's happening next quarter and click on the prototype and it brings up the prototype and then 
this is what's happening, you know, three, this is what, this is what might happen three years down the line. And that's what everyone wants to see. But um, yeah, the, you end up with a list, you can just filter and sort it. And it, so the tagging on it's really powerful. Um, cool. Yeah, so, so something like that. I mean, if you yeah. want to um, do a little uh, work. That, yeah, yeah, that sounds interesting. I, I might give you a shout tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to throw in something here because this is always on my mind at the moment. A lot of companies are jumping straight to an AI solution and they don't know what the opportunity is. So <laughs> it goes back to that. Start with the opportunity and work out if AI is your solution that brings the best pop possible you know, value. Mm. Is it value based or is it we've got an AI shiny? let's do ai like yeah just yeah put ai on it <laughs> i get i was thinking about doing a talk on this adam this whole thing it's like um yeah because ai is just a tool really isn't it it's 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 just a really powerful tool but the history even the recent history of, of how humans use tools i mean it's definitely not always i reckon in my head, it's like ten percent of the way people use tools is really useful. <laughs> five percent, five percent is just terribly destructive, and then about eighty-five percent is cat gifts. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, just just stuff. But it does something. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, uh, there's no evidence. Uh, there's no research gone into those numbers. <laughs> um any any final questions for simon otherwise we will thank him again and we will do our final couple of slides which i've added a couple into the deck for for, for amusing effect so uh, i think you're, yeah. you're cool. up with your slides yeah let's go then right then let's go back to this uh so I hope, ooh, hopefully everyone can see that can you see that yeah, good so uh i well, while we were talking uh, I produced some pictures of uh, rooms which have got wallpapers of customer journeys on them from Dali. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I wanted to see what rooms looked like with the most expensive wallpaper in the world. And they look proper beautiful. I mean, like, look at this one. <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> So, so, so I think I think if anything, we're going to make a, a new wallpaper design that comes out of this and sell it to Habitat or somebody. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. So that, that I thought that was quite amusing. Um, right. Uh, question answer that we've done. Um, final two slides. Uh, there are some upcoming events which we want to shout out. Uh, so, uh, Kanban Coaching Exchange tomorrow uh, is around the theory of constraints. I'm a big talk fan, so go and have a look at that. Um, there's going to be an interesting AI and org design session, which is an uh, Ventures of Agile talk next uh, Tuesday, which has got Craig Larman. And Craig Larman is always good value. Uh, so Craig Larman as of uh, less than UML. Um, so that will be really interesting to see, see what, what that comes up with. So uh, I'm going to try and work out how I can see a feed of that. Um, much more importantly than, than Craig Lauman, though, uh, the week after that, uh, I am talking at uh, Agile Bristol and Bath. So if you want to come along to that, uh, click on the link and you can come talk, to, uh, see me talk about Agile Finance. Uh, week after that, uh, uh, there's an in-person meetup from uh, Product Tank in London about using data as a product manager. Uh, Thursday, the 29th. Uh, there's a piece around psychological uh, psychology of change and how to lead it uh, from the systemic agile guys, which look really interesting. Um, into July, uh, Thursday, the 6th of July, Kanban Dan is doing his talk around the heretics of Scrum and Kanban, which is always useful. So I, I, I loved his talk around the, the coaching styles uh, from rugby into, uh, into uh, agile, which was great. Um, July 12th, uh, another and supported meetup. Um, uh, Ellie Hughes from Digital, who's our uh, experimentation guru, is doing a piece around experimentation. There's a meetup, uh, physical meetup in London uh, to come along to. And then our next talk will actually be July the 19th. We currently don't have anyone in the book to do the talk. Uh, we have a couple of people we're talking to, but if anybody, 
would like to actually get involved, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, if anyone would like to get involved, uh, please give us a shout. At this point, we want to make sure that, that the community has an opportunity to kind of share anything else that they are doing or they want people to know about. So uh, does anyone have anything else they would like to shout out at this point? I'm going to shout one out. Um, I okay. have um, another one in July. I think it's either the Tuesday or the Thursday after Agile Reading, so the day before or the day after. And I'm going to be doing a talk on AI and how it's definitely, definitely not going to replace your job, hopefully. Excellent. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Uh, and that's, cool. Reading, that's at a, a, uh, a local place in Reading. So if you're interested, I will be posting it on LinkedIn. Nice. Uh, and then our final slide before I let everyone go, Corp Speakers, uh, we've got lots of really good people who want to do talks. If you want to do a small talk, cool, let us know. We can work out how we might do kind of a couple of lightning talks. So you don't, may not have to do like a 40, 45 minute talk. We might find two people who want to do 20 minute talks. But just get in, get in contact with me or Adam and we will sort that out. So. Thank you all for your time again. So, uh, and thank you for Adam uh, for his talk from Warsaw. Uh, thank you for everybody who dialed in. Uh, and uh, yeah, have a lovely evening. Oh, cool. thanks everyone. Cheers all. Thanks, bye bye. Guys. bye.